Greetings, my name is David Mashburn, and I'm a certified instructor for the SANS Institute. This video is the first in a series of videos that will explore DNS concepts, tools, and their application to open source intelligence. DNS is a core service that is in our IP-based networks. DNS has great application for us as an open source intelligence investigator, a pen tester, or as a cyber defender. We want to make sure that we understand what DNS is, how it works, and what types of data we can actually get from DNS. So what is DNS? And this is really what we want to explore here. And DNS is the domain name system, and it's a standard that we use in networking to help us get the resources that we are requesting. The DNS name provides a friendly way for us as users of computer systems to specify what we want to access. DNS takes care of translating that friendly name into the IP address that is actually used by computer systems to send our network traffic back and forth between those resources. For example, our computer may send traffic to various IP addresses. So it may send it to things like 8.8.8.8 or 172.217.7.164. Now those are IP addresses that are associated with the resources from Google. However, not everyone is really gonna remember things like that. And so instead of typing in these numbers, we are much more likely to remember words and especially words that have meaning in our own language. So we use names like amazon.com or Netflix or Google, and we use those to access these resources. And that may be on the public internet, or it may be internal inside our organization. So given our dependence on DNS, DNS is probably one of the single most important protocols we'll deal with. Uh, some people say it's the second most important. I tend to think it's actually the most important because everything that happens on the internet depends on DNS returning the correct answer to the question that we have been asking. So why do we care about DNS? Well, we have a couple different use cases we can explore here, and we're gonna start out by looking at it from the perspective of OSINT. Now, DNS data is easily accessible, it's typically public, so we can collect that data without someone necessarily being aware that we're actually doing so. Now, there are certain cases when we're pulling data where we may have some operational security considerations, but we'll explore some of those things in a future video. Now, DNS does provide a significant set of information, and then we can take this data and pivot to other pieces of information. So we can use DNS to get things like that mapping between the friendly name and the address, but then once we have that IP address, we can do things like geolocate that data. We can find the associated autonomous system number, which is just a logical way of tying together related networks, and that may help us understand who controls or owns those particular hosts. Um, of course, we can use this to support our OSIN efforts, and so we see not only the records that we can query for in DNS, but we may also understand what type of email they're using. Maybe they're using a service provider, they've outsourced it to someone else. Uh, and this is very much the same type of step that we see taken by people like penetration testers who do the same type of host enumeration, looking for services that are out there. And so those use cases are very, very, very similar. Now from the Defender's perspective, uh, DNS is a very rich source of intelligence. Looking through the log of DNS requests and responses, uh, we can see what is actually being communicated with inside a particular network. So we can determine if there are hosts that are communicating with things that may be known bad domains. Uh, this is a typical use case for things like cyber intelligence threat feeds. This may generate an alert in real time. Of course, we may also simply be able to run that list of known bad or restricted domains against something like a filtering system. And so that can be used to help enforce corporate policies and make sure that people are adhering to things like the acceptable use policy. So let's take a look at the various types of information that are available to us from DNS. Now we're gonna use the word zone and a DNS zone is just a collection of essentially related records for a particular domain. This is where the responsibility for maintaining those records has been delegated to an organization or an individual and those individual records that are available in DNS are often the most interesting things to us.
So we take a look at the table on the bottom of the slide, we see some of the common record types we encountered. Now this is certainly not a comprehensive list of the available record types, it's just a listing of some of the ones that may be of interest to us. There are many other record types, and there are some important record types we haven't necessarily listed here, but these are the ones you may most frequently encounter. And so we start out with something like a name server record, which is basically a way of telling, hey, if I have a question about a particular domain, who do I speak to? In terms of things like an MX record, the mail exchanger record, that says, hey, if I'm sending mail to you, who do I talk to? For the case of the A or the quad A records, those are the IPv4 mapping between a name for an A record uh, and the quad A, which is the mapping to IPv6. And so we have those very common record types. And of course, finally, we have these text records, which are interesting because they are arbitrary text. So they can be anything. And because they can be anything, that means there may be some interesting data that we can collect and go from there. Now, one of the things we need to remember about DNS is DNS really only answers the specific question that we ask. So unless a server is either misconfigured or has been intentionally configured to say, give you everything it knows, you have to ask it a question. So if I wanna know about www.sans.org, I send a query and I get a response. I can't ask the server, hey, tell me everything you know about the sans.org zone because that's not how it works. So let's take a look and let's see how DNS flows. We'll take a look at a simple example. And so we start out as a computer user in the top left and say we want to send a request to load the web page at www.sans.org. There are a lot of things that have to happen before that request gets sent out to the web server. We have to do that translation to find out the IP address associated with www.sans.org. So the first thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna to try to query our local DNS server. But the local DNS server says, hey, you know what? You know what? I'm not really in charge of the records for sans.org, so I'm going to recurse for you. I'm going to ask other DNS servers to find this information and then return the query to you as a client. So the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to kind of work through the name backwards. So the local DNS server is going to query out to the root servers. And the root servers will say, hey, root server, well, can you tell me who's in charge of the top level domain.org? And so that reply comes back from the server. And the next one is going to say, okay, so for the name servers for .org, can you tell me something about sans.org? And that response comes back. And then finally, once we know who the name servers are for sans.org, we can go ask the name servers for sans.org, can you tell me about www.sans.org? And so once that reply comes back to the local DNS server, it may cache it there for a period of time, but it will return the response of that query to the client. And now the client's browser is able to make that particular connection out to the website. So to summarize here, this brief introduction to the fundamentals of DNS, uh, there are many other important elements, but we've covered some of the basics here. It's a core protocol in our IP networks. It helps us translate between names and IP addresses, and it can be a valuable source of data for us as an O-Center, as a pen tester, or as a cyber defender. Thanks very much. Hope you'll join us for our next video in this series.